today we're going to talk about determinants with every square matrix there is a constant number c associated with it called the determinant taking the determinant of a square matrix can be viewed as a function whose input is a square matrix and whose output is a number the determinant is useful for solving linear equations test for invertibility of a matrix capturing how linear transformations change area or volume etc now let me start with a matrix like this remember that this matrix is associated with a linear transformation this matrix will take the input basis vector i hat and j hat to 2 0 and 3 0 respectively so in a way this matrix stretches the x and y axis let me calculate the area of this square formed by i hat and j hat let us call this area a1 the transformed vectors form this new rectangle which has an area of a2 now here's the punch line the determinant of a matrix is defined in such a way that it represents the ratio of the new area to the old area so the determinant tells me the amplification of the area or volume of the box formed by the standard basis vectors in the input space so for any general 2 by 2 matrix the formula for determinant turns out to be ad minus bc you can take any matrix that you want to and can verify this formula geometrically as well for our example up here the determinant turns out to be 2 into 3 minus 0 into 0 which equals 6 as you could already see in the graph below now for the 3d space we look at the volume of the cube formed by the standard basis vectors i hat j hat and k hat after the transformation you would get something like a box and if you calculate its volume it would equal the determinant of the matrix same goes for n dimensional space as well of course you cannot think about n dimensional boxes geometrically but you get the idea an important thing to remember is that determinants are defined only for square matrices if i were to take a rectangular matrix like this one it would be the transformation of a vector from 3d space to a 2d space the input vector is x y z but the output vector only has two components graphically you can see that it's a comparison of apples and oranges we get three output vectors how would we even make a box from three vectors consistently every time moreover the basis vectors in 3d would form a cube but the transformed basis vectors which are in 2d can never form a three dimensional object i'm sure you can see that so that's why determinants are only defined for square matrices now here's another definition a matrix is called singular if and only if the determinant of the matrix is zero this terminology is only for square matrices determinant of a equal to 0 implies that the inverse matrix does not exist once again i'll show it to you with an example the determinant of this matrix turns out to be 0 but why does this imply that the inverse won't exist remember that the determinant can be thought of as the ratio of two areas or volumes if it's 0 it means the numerator goes to 0 in 2d space for a parallelogram area is 0 if either the adjacent sides overlap or one or more sides have zero length If I show the transformation of this matrix A, you can see that the vectors i hat lands at one two, and the vector j hat lands at two four. Both of them are on the same line. They don't really form a parallelogram anymore. The adjacent sides are overlapping, and so the area goes to zero. In fact, every vector from the input space is mapped to somewhere on this line. This line is the column space of A. So this transformation is not surjective, and this means that the inverse does not exist for this matrix. check out the fourth episode of the series to know more about surjectivity but what it essentially means is that there is some vector in the output space like this b here which is not an image of any vector of the input space now that we know a little bit about determinants let's learn to calculate them we already know what the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix looks like now let's look at a 3 by 3 matrix to find its determinant we first define what a minor is the minor of an element of a determinant is just the determinant of the matrix that you would obtain if you erase the row and column of that particular element so to obtain the minor of 1 1 delete the row 1 and column 1 and write the determinant of the remaining matrix similarly for m 1 2 forget about row 1 and column 2 and write the determinant of the remaining matrix once again for m 3 3 forget about the last row and the last column and write the determinant of a 1 a 2 b 1 b 2 another term that is often used is the cofactor of an element the cofactor of the element ij is minus 1 raised to the power of i plus j multiplied with the minor of ij 
using the minus we've already found, we can easily find the respective cofactors. Now we are ready to calculate the determinant of A. It is given by A1 C11 plus B1 C12 plus C1 C13. This is when you do the expansion along row 1. But you can also write the determinant by expanding along any other row or column like B1 C12 plus B2 C22 plus B3 C32. This is when you expand along column 2. So you can evaluate the determinant along any row or column but you should always prefer the one with the maximum number of zeros in it. An example should make this process clear. The determinant of this matrix expanding along the first row is 1 times C11 plus 2 times C12 plus 3 times C13. Now substitute for the cofactors and you get the answer as 12. What I just told you works for any n by n matrix. For a 4x4 four four matrix, I can expand along the first row and this is what it looks like. Notice how you just need to figure out the sign of the first element and then they just keep oscillating to minus plus, minus plus and so on. Now pause the video and digest this formula. Only after you practice calculating a few determinants will you get a hang of it. Remember, practice makes perfect. Now let's discuss some of the important properties of determinants. Don't dwell too much on the specific proof of every property. The goal is to develop an intuition for each property and practice using them in problems. The first one is that the determinant of any identity matrix, no matter what its size is, is going to be 1. To see why, try expanding along the first row. Since you're at it, think about why the determinant of any upper or lower triangular matrix is just the product of its diagonal elements. Next, property number 2. If each element of any row or column gets multiplied by a constant k, then the value of the determinant gets multiplied by k. As an example, let me take this determinant delta 1 that looks like this. And now look at this other determinant. The last two rows have the same elements. But the first row of delta 2 is 2 times of that of delta 1. From the above property, we can conclude that delta 2 is 2 times delta 1. Which means that we can pull out 2 from the first row of delta 2. So you can say that scalar multiplication works differently for matrices and determinants. Given this matrix A, 2A would have each and every element multiplied by 2. I am interested in the relationship between the determinants of these two matrices. Delta 2 is the determinant of 2a. Now I can pull out a 2 from each row. So I get 2 to the power of 3 outside, leaving these simple rows inside. So delta 2 turns out to be 2 to the power of 3 times delta 1. In general, the determinant of ka is equal to k to the power of n times the determinant of a, where n is the order of the matrix. The third property says that exchanging any two rows or columns of a determinant would only change the sign of the value of the determinant. So if I switch the row 1 and row 2, the value of determinant is minus delta 1. Similarly, this delta 4 here, where the column 1 and 2 are switched, is again equal to minus delta 1. The fourth property is if any two rows or columns of a determinant are equal or proportionate, then the determinant is 0. Why? Well, switching rows should switch signs of the determinant. But the elements of the determinant look exactly the same as well. The number 0 is the only one that has the same positive and negative value. The next property is regarding splitting the determinant. Here, every element in the first row is the sum of two numbers. So we get the first determinant with one set of numbers and the next one with the other set of numbers. Notice that this splitting happens only across one row and the remaining rows stay the same in both the determinants. So if you want to know why this works, try expanding the left hand side along row 1. Also, this process works for columns as well. The sixth property is that linear row or column operations won't change the value of the determinant. Say you have this complex looking determinant with the x's and abc's and we perform the row operation r3 goes to r3 minus r2. This would reduce the last row to a simpler form. In a similar fashion, we carry out the next row operation. But now we carry out a column operation, C2 goes to C2 minus C1. We do this to obtain two zeros in column 2. Now expanding along C2, we get the following simplified expression. If we were given that ABC are an arithmetic progression, 
that is b minus a is equal to c minus b, this expression would simplify to 0. I picked this question from the ISI 2011 MSQE exam. A few things to note here. First, there is no concept of pivots when simplifying determinants. Our goal is to get a row or a column such that it has majority of zeros, so that expansion along it would be easy. Next, you can mix row and column operations with determinants, but remember that you should stick to only row operations with matrices. The seventh property is that the determinant of the transpose of a matrix is equal to the determinant of the original matrix. Take the same old example again and switch its rows with columns to obtain the transposed matrix. If you try expanding a A along row 1 and A T along column 1, you will find that they are equal. The final property is that the determinant of the product of two matrices is equal to the product of the determinants of the individual matrices. This remarkable property holds only when both A and B are square matrices and have the same order. They must be square because of the right hand side of the equation and they must be of the same order because of the left hand side. That's about it for now. There are a few other properties related to determinants but you can probably do without them. In the description below, I'll attach the questions they've asked in the DAC and ISI exams related to this topic. Also, I'll attach the chapter of determinants from the NCRD book. You can go through it for more solved examples and problems related to what I've just covered in this video. It actually works pretty well for the entrances. Well, I hope you guys had fun because this might be the last video in the series. So if you liked what you saw, please subscribe and share this with your friends and juniors as well. If anyone is interested in regular tuitions for their undergraduate math and economics related subjects, you can find my contact details in the description link below. Thank you.